Welcome to episode 2 of the Origin series, and today we're going to be looking at what I believe to be a very interesting subject, the nut and the bolt. Now many of you are going to go, oh my gosh, what is he talking about? That's got to be one of the driest subjects on the planet. Well, it has to do with the Roman Empire, it has to do with ME109s and Spitfires, and it has to do with the victory in Europe. In World War II and it's got a lot more going on there too. Every device that you're watching this on is influenced by the nut and bolt and is actually held together with a number of its cousins, the screw and also a few nuts and bolts just for good measure. So it is literally all about that and the nut too. So basically, why is it so important? Is it really the chicken or the egg? Well, that's what we're going to try and find out today. So many people go into a hardware store today or they simply troll online and they buy any kind of nut and bolt that they can see, provided that it fits in. But there's actually a lot more to it. And one of the most interesting parts of the actual nut and bolt is the actual thread itself. And we're going to be talking about really the why, the what, where and the how. And they're the key themes for this origin series. So how did the nut and bolt actually come about? Well I've done a heck of a lot of research on this and it's really quite interesting. A number of people have done a lot of research into finding out roughly when it came about and there's no key date. You can't simply put it down to a day, date and time but we can put it down roughly to a year. The concept of using actual a thread or like a wood screw to actually bind two pieces of material together dates back to about 400 BC and this is when there is actual physical evidence of the screw actually being used. Around about 200 to 275 BC there's the first example of the bolt being used. Now this actually wasn't a threaded bolt in the sense this was actually a shaft that was then forced through two pieces of material and then on the other end there was a fastener of some kind to actually clamp them together. Now I'm talking a lot about clamping material together and this is something that I'm just going to elaborate on for just a minute or two. A lot of people think that a bolt has its strength from the actual circumference or the thickness of the thread. That is only partly true. It's actually due to the thread itself. Now an example that I'm going to use of this is your wheel nuts on your car or your four wheel drive. Now many people will come across the sad, sad situation of driving down a street, driving down an isolated road and boom, the wheel comes off. It's going faster than the car and it's going out to nowhere, it's just going out to the sunrise or the sunset depending on what time of day. How this has occurred is due to the wheel nuts becoming loose, all the wheel nuts being tightened too much, but I'm going to talk about the second one in that, the wheel nuts becoming loose. Once the wheel nut becomes loose or the bolt becomes loose, the strength is no longer there. There's no longer the strength to actually ply that bit of material to the host bit of material or the axle assembly, there's nothing to bind it together. So it's relying purely on the strength of that wheel nut, which it doesn't have a great amount. And over time, getting hit backwards and forwards, fatigue fractures form. These crack and then the wheel comes flying off the car. This is the same for any nut or bolt that is put under high tensile pressure. So it is really, really important that before you go off on that big expedition that you check your wheel nuts, you look in your workshop manual and you make sure that they're to the right torque setting. Don't get the biggest pole known to man and tighten them up so strong that even Hercules couldn't get them undone because that's going to cause them to shear off. So that's where the strength actually comes in a nut and bolt and depending on what that nut and bolt's going to be used for will depend on how fine or how coarse the thread is 
And another subject we're actually going to get into is the actual tensile strength of it. Once the potential of the nut and bolt was realised and the actual the binding force and how it was actually a key important part in actual developing structures and machinery, it actually started to expand its influence. Though the nut and bolt that we actually know today didn't really come about until the 15th century. And by that I mean using either a square nut or actually using a hex head. And later on the French actually developed in the 16th century under a guy called Benson a machine that was actually capable of mass, mass producing nuts and bolts. It was a rather complex machine and later the British actually brought out their own version which was a lot easier to use and actually meant that the mass production could be a lot quicker. The Americans also got in on the show and they actually produced one of the first nut and bolt standardized systems and this was actually the UNC. Now I've had a look around at a few sources with this and I'm not entirely sure if it's correct but that's what it says on paper and these are academic engineering papers that I've looked at. But the, the key problem with the UNC thread is it's actually a very much a pitched thread so it's got a point on it. Now probably one of the most eccentric engineers of the 18th century was actually Charles Joseph Whitworth and this guy is awesome. He's a personal hero of mine. I think he's absolutely brilliant. This guy built a combine harvester, one of the most accurate rifles of the 1800s, and actually built Britain's first nut and bolt standardized system. He also built the most important machine of the Industrial Revolution, and this was actually the micrometer. Now, talking a little bit more about the Industrial Revolution, this is when the nut and bolt actually started to really spread out and get used in a variety of different machines, different components. And Charles Whitworth's uh, BSW, or Whitworth thread that he actually designed, was a much more refined version of the UNC. It actually used a beveled pitch, so it's actually a curved pitch on the thread. And this means it's a greater surface area so therefore it has a lot more binding force it can be put up to a lot greater torque with still using a relatively same coarse thread that is the difference between UNC and Whitworth thread if you go into a shop and someone says oh Whitworth threads the same as a UNC you can tell them with pride that it is not I've been told for many years that it is, and it is not. The pitch of the thread is completely different. Read up on it, make sure you know what you're selling, go forward. Just a little side note there. But the Industrial Revolution really had a profound effect. Moving on, what they found was actually that these coarser threads just didn't tolerate higher torque or higher impact environments. So they had to develop a thread that was much finer, that had a greater surface area. And this meant that the BCF thread was actually formed. The French then got in on it too and they actually developed their own thread, the SAE, which was actually the metric thread. And this was even finer again. This meant that a lot of alloys such as brass, aluminium could actually be also used for nuts and bolts too. Now we're getting towards the end of the 1800s and obviously we're getting to the end of the Victorian era and getting into the short period or the short gasp of the Edwardian era. Sadly what ended that it wasn't the sinking of the Titanic, no it was the Great War or World War One and you would have thought that by then, everyone would have moved away from these pesky, annoying, eccentric threads such as the BCF and the BSW, the Whitworth threads. But they didn't. They came back and they just spread, they just multiplied. And the reason being is that a Whitworth bolt actually has a slightly smaller head compared to its UNF or its UNC imperial counterparts. 
So this means you need a specific set of spanners and you need a specific set of sockets to work on a vehicle or a machine that actually has Whitworth nut and bolts. And the reason why it was so popular during the First World War and the Second World War was that you could actually make more bolts using less steel because the heads were actually slightly smaller. Now we're talking about minuscule bits of steel, but if that's the difference between victory and surrendering, then so be it. And things went on from there. During the 1930s, the Germans obviously got in on it too, and they obviously adopted a heck of a lot of metric threads too. One of the big problems that came out and the next big evolution in thread development on a world scale was after World War II. Now, what the Allies found was that they had three or four different armies that they actually had to supply. And being a quartermaster and actually having to supply them with the right fasteners was an absolute logistical nightmare. Now, sadly, after World War II, they could already see that the next war was coming, and this was going to be with the Soviets. And so they decided that they actually needed a thread that everyone would use, and everyone could adopt, and that then if World War III happened, they could simply provide one fastener to fix it all. And this is where the UNF and the UNC really became well known, and UNF in particular. Sadly though, towards the mid-60s, it was seen that, well, World War Three hadn't started yet, had it? So what's the point in adopting these U UNF and UNC bolts? So, I guess you could say the stubborn British in some regards, they kept soldiering on with the BSW threads and the BCF threads. And they've just hung around ever since then. Even the brand new Defender Puma and I would even say the brand new Range Rover of Vogue still has a couple BCF and a BSW threads stuck in there just to keep you on your toes. But with that and the UNF and obviously Armageddon not coming about, the metric thread became more and more adopted. Here in Australia we went over to the metric system in 1966. The British went over to it in, I think, 1972. And ever since then, it's sort of grown and grown further and further from there. So it's really interesting looking at where the threads come from. The threads themselves actually can cause a great deal of damage, as I was talking about earlier, about tightening and getting the right pitch on the thread. One of the prime, prime examples I've heard of that, and it was the story of a guy I was working with, Bryden, and he was a machinist. And he was making this tiny little fastener to go on this wall. It was for a wall bracket, for a lamp or something. And he couldn't figure out what the thread was. And he went and asked his supervisor, and this guy was a real guru, and he said it's actually a German thread from the Second World War. It's an imperial thread, but the pitch of the thread is ever so slightly different compared to the British Imperial Thread, or the BSW, or the BCF Thread. Now, that doesn't sound very interesting, but the reason why the Germans did it is really, really cunning. Now, the British were actually capturing German fighters and obviously testing them, and obviously with the likes of SOE and MI5, they were using them to actually penetrate into Nazi or occupied airspace in Europe. What they would do though with these threads, because they were slightly off, the British would get the planes, they would put their own bolts in and they'd go, ooh, ooh, these fit nicely and they're nice and tight, that's all good. But once the planes took off and they got put up to three, four, five Gs or so, these would cause the actual threads to start the bolts actually starting to move in and out with the g-force and over time over one or two combat missions this would cause the bolts to cause this would cause the bolts to have fatigue fractures and then the bolt would actually shear off and this would mean you would lose a motor or you'd lose a whole wing would fly off your aircraft and that was the end of you and your mission 
So that just goes to show how interesting and how important it is to get the right thread for the right job. And the tensile strength of the thread is something that I'm going to move on to now. Now, I'm just going to be very short and brief on this, but basically when you get a bolt, it'll have a grade number on it. And it'll be a grade 7, a grade 5, a grade 2, or it'll be mild grade steel. Now the reason why we've got these different tensiles and thread, tensile and bolts, is due to the carbon content and other impurities that they've actually moulded into the steel to give it higher tensile strength. Now that means that we can actually use a bolt that is this size instead of being that size to hold the same amount of weight. And that means we're using a half or a fifth of the steel that we would need if we were using mild grade steel. Now if you look at anything particularly from the early 1800s or the 1700s, you'll notice particularly with regards to padlocks, if they're wanting to lock up something valuable, there'll be a huge padlock on it. And that's because the tensile of the steel, or how to manipulate the steel to have a higher tensile, really wasn't known at that stage. So all they could do is make it bigger, and that would therefore be the ultimate deterrent. But luckily today, we've got the tensile. Now, depending on what application you're wanting to use this for, it's very important. If you're wanting something to actually be fastened down hard and firm under huge amounts of pressure, you probably want to go something with a higher tensile steer, higher tensile rating on it. But if you need something with a bit of flex, such as an engine mount or something like that, you might want to go for something a little bit less. The problem with steel is the higher the tensile or the higher the actual strength you have, the greater the chance it has of actually fatiguing and actually cracking and then shearing. So steel's a real funny one. You have to get it right, and if you don't, you can easily get it wrong. But anyway, that's a brief history on the nut and bolt. Be sure to check it out, and the next time you're buying a few nuts and bolts and a few fasteners, bear to give it a thought where it actually came from and what it's done for us now.